Okay, everybody, I just wanted to take the time to do a, a demonstration for the McAfee SaaS web technology or web protection technology. Uh, one thing I want to make sure and mention right off the bat here is that uh, this technology is actually based on the same uh, gateway anti-malware engine that's utilized for the on-premise solution. So a lot of the same technology for the McAfee on-premise solution is in the uh, cloud solution as well. Uh, the reason why that's important is because Gartner actually consistently rates McAfee's malware scanning engine as the best in the industry. So uh, the amount of technology and the benefit from a uh, viral protection standpoint, which is the base principle of this solution to begin with, is going to be something that um, you know is you know transparently moved into the cloud. So it's going to benefit you a lot. Another thing I want to make sure and mention here is that uh, McAfee, of course, is an Intel company. So uh, because they're owned by Intel, they can dedicate a lot more resources and engineering headcount to the development on further development of the product. So you're going to see a lot of um, you know similarities in the uh, gateway product as for to the cloud product. But as it progresses for the next um, you know few years or few months, actually, you're going to be able to see dramatic increases in what um, the product has the capability to do. And it's already a very, very robust product. So that being said, um, we'll kind of jump into a little bit. Uh, now, first and foremost, I mean, of course, you're going to have general reporting capabilities. You can, um, you know, kind of find out, you know, who's doing what, where they're going. You know, you can uh, allow content by user, allow content by site, block content, really just get a general idea of where everything's going. That's going to be inside of the reporting tab. But um, right off the back, you can do just a traffic overview for a general snapshot just to kind of see, you know, how everything's going. And, you know, if there's an increased meter of block sites, for people going to them during peak hours or maybe you know at noon a dramatic increase in uh, block sites happened um, maybe something to look at maybe something to check out uh, but you also could be able to just build a report on something like that so if it does happen in that manner to wherever there's a massive spike um, from your you know outbound or inbound traffic um, we can uh, you know analyze that quickly and get to it so it's just one of those things however overall this is just meant to be a general snapshot with uh, you know some pre canned reporting that you can check out I believe that the reporting period is 60 days on this particular product itself uh, for the canned reports and then for the actual true forensics uh, if you wanted to go down inside of this tab uh, that's gonna be for a rolling 12 months uh, if you wanted to go to the nitty-gritty and find out each you know IP address and all that other good stuff. But the canned reports, they drop off after um, about 60 days. Uh, now, jumping into it, realistically speaking, just like with the email product, the uh, meat and potatoes is the policies. And uh, this product is even more easy to demonstrate than the uh, email just because there's, you know, less things going on. The principle is very, very simplistic and straightforward, and that's what makes it so effective. Uh, the goal of this product is to do two things. It's to increase your protection because web is associated with around 60% of infections now in this current, you know, era uh, that we're dealing with because because of the release of Web 2.0 and Web 2.0 threats. And also it is to increase productivity. I'm going to show you how you can do both those things real quickly by just going into the default web policies and kind of kicking around for a second. Uh, so first and foremost, you know, double click on it, hit edit, whatever you want to do, bring it up. Uh, name and policy, you know, identify it, all that other good stuff. And then you can just kind of jump right into it. Um, now, Website reputation is going to be one of the first things that we're going to be really wanting to uh, scan on, I guess you could say. Uh, this thing um, down here at the bottom is the Trusted Sites Anti-Malware Bypass. Now, we put that in there um, for some specific reasons, like for co companies that send off uh, some, um, you know, a little bit more interesting type of equipment, like sometimes we'll work with uh, software companies that have to send or receive or download products that actually function in essence like spyware, like um, you know monitoring devices for kids or something like that to make sure they're not going to websites they're not supposed to. In essence, that is spyware, and sometimes they can use that trusted size anti-malware bypass in order to make sure that um, you know there's no issues during the download of that you know equipment or that um, material, but at 
at the exact same time. Really, is there not? A, there's not a really good reason to have something bypass the malware uh, scan. And the reason why is things like um, you know the Disney outbreak that happened a few years ago. Uh, they had a couple of banners that were infected inside of their environment. Disney's a well trusted name. Everybody pretty much trusts Disney, but it doesn't mean that it won't infect your entire environment if uh, you don't have a, a virus scanning technology. Um, and that's a you know extremely large corporation with massive protection in place. So regardless of whoever you do business with or whatever the situation is, you always want to have this active and you really don't want anybody bypassing. And then you base off of the URL extensions and what the, where those locations are going and whatever they're doing to determine if we want to allow or deny them from even being able to go there, uh, which is what that website reputation is. This is still based off of something called trusted source. It's the world's largest knock list of like listed domains that are known to have malware. Uh, so if for any particular situation, um, you know, uh, you come across a website that we know to have malware, we're going to be able to block you from being able to go there before you click on it. Because sometimes it's not malicious. It's not malice of forethought. You're not trying to infect your computer, obviously. But, you know, you can, you know, try to go to weather.com. You switch the E and the A. And then before you know it, you're at a park domain that has an infection on it, which, you know, takes over your machine. Not a good thing. Definitely don't want that to happen. This allows us to kind of allow your users to bowl with bumpers on, you know, know where they're going, uh, know where they intend to go, but we're going to keep them out of the gutter. Uh, from a category perspective, this is just uh, f really more of a productivity tool uh, more than anything else. Now, I do I think that the trusted sites category here is nice uh, because you can block, you know, specific areas. So if you know that you need to block gambling, but you want to allow one specific site, you can do that. Uh, golden nugget. Okay, I'm going to block gambling, but I'm going to allow to go to the golden nugget or Harrah's. That's perfectly fine because you do business with them. No problems, no issues, not a problem. But you do want to make sure that from a uh, total perspective that you're not allowing people to just access whatever they want to either. So if you want to block things like social networking or media or anything else like that, which I'll go to in a second, you can um, globally deny that. Um, to increase that productivity standpoint, I guess you could say a little bit better, and then specifically allow things you need for business. Um, one thing I do want to make sure and mention here is that there's no way to make an IT per person look like the bad guy more than the guy that blocks them from being able to go to their sites. I'm going to show them how I'm going to show you how you can do both. You can block them from going to the sites um, that are not appropriate but you can also allow them to go to those sites during appropriate times because that uh, compromise really uh, harmonizes the IT department with the rest of the uh, entire organization. Um, you know, the higher ups are happy in general just because productivity is going to go higher, but also the uh, end users or the actual people that are affected by these policies are going to be happy too because at least they can access that during like their lunch break or anything. So applications, anything that you work with um, that you want to be able to allow them to communicate with, like obviously things like voice over IP, you know, if you're using that, you want to be allowing those applications, but things like, you know, peer to peer, uh, file sharing, um, anonymizers. Uh, right now we have those on allow. Um, if you have an application that's an anonymizer, a P2P or something like that, usually I would want to deny something like that. But once again, it allows you to globally blacklist those things. And then, you know, you can make your own decisions if there's anything else that you want to add in later on or whitelist later on. So that's another thing that you do have the capability to do. And then, of course, we have the uh, media tab. Um, that's for just transmitting any type of media documentation or anything else like that. And any websites you want to be able to pass that. Um, one thing that I always want to make sure and mention is think of all these tabs as a layer of scanning. Uh, did it pass the threats? Okay, great. Well, now we're going to check its category. Now we're going to check and see if it violates application. Now we're going to check if it violates media. That's the reason why you see filter bypass because each one of these is a filter that it has to go through. It has to meet all these filters in order to make it into your environment, which that overlaying or overlapping protection really gives you a honed uh, very specific, very strong security infrastructure, and it really decreases the amount on these support tickets that you're going to have associated with uh, web threats or web malware or anything else like that. That is going to be huge for your business just because um, you can actually calculate uh, the return on investment for a web solution, which I'm going to do for you at the end. So um, either way, 
uh, moving on a little bit further, SSL. If you have anybody that you need to connect to via that tunnel, you can do that. And then, of course, you can um, do uh, block sites as well. Uh, block sites is just going to be your kind of list of sites that you don't want to be able to go to or that you specifically blacklist. Um, you, you can see right here, Facebook, YouTube, MySpace. Um, nobody goes to MySpace anymore, but, um, you know, these probably are blocked. The uh, Facebook and the YouTube, our Facebook's probably blocked for a productivity standpoint. Um, YouTube and LimeWire, um, those are probably going to be blocked because they don't want people to uh, consume uh, internal resources. Um, LimeWire Double Duty, it's probably going to be blocked because it's going to be consuming bandwidth, but it's also a huge uh, virus threat. You don't want someone putting LimeWire on their home machine and then, you know, or putting LimeWire on their business machine and then causing an infection for the entire network. So definitely things to keep in mind on that particular aspect. And then, of course, notifications. You put in whatever you really want to. It comes up McAfee. Hey, you're going to a bad place. Don't do it. Um, Policy scheduling, this goes to the part wherever I was talking to you about how you can actually, you know, block people during specific times and allow them during other times. Um, so what you do is you have your available groups and you have your policy and you can actually say, you know what, I'm going to set this policy for this group um, during this time. So you can have, um, you know, this policy for lunch hour, and then you can have the default policy running every time, other time. So if you wanted to create a lunch hour policy, whoever Facebook, MySpace, YouTube, Twitter, any of that stuff is completely available, you're going to allow that and say, hey, during these times, you're allowed to access it. Outside of those times, you should be dealing with business. Um, and all it is is you just drag and you just select what you want to be doing. Very, 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 very easy, very, very straightforward um, way to make sure that you are, um, you know, really uh, helping out your workforce, making sure they're happy, making sure that they're not, you know, upset that they just can't do any of their own personal activities while they're at work, but still keeping that productivity a little bit higher. So um, kind of a good on both sides, if you will. Um, and then McAfee client proxy settings. I'm actually going to describe that here in the setup side a little bit more. So um, let me run into that. Uh, there are three different ways or a few different ways actually that you can set this up. I believe there's actually four. Um, first of which is IP range authentication. Uh, basically, you're just going to say, hey, everybody within this IP range are going to submit to this specific policy. Um, that is one way to be able to do it. Um, if you have something like a, um, a good example would be like a Wi-Fi area or something like that, wherever the uh, Wi-Fi is automatically associating um, IP addresses to individuals underneath a specific subdomain to make sure that they are, you know, pulling in. Well, if you want them to configure to these policies or these rules, you can kind of create an IP range authentication for that. Sometimes businesses, though, do have an IP th authentication range for their entire environment uh, because everybody should be subject to the same rules. It's not common, but it can happen. So it's up to you on that. We also have explicit user authentication, which is going to take you a little bit more into um, Active Directory synchronization and making sure that you're identifying specific users. Um, obviously, with IP range, you don't know who the users are. So you can't do specific user reporting. Whereas with explicit user authentication, you're going to be able to dig down a little bit further, um, create those individualized policies for individualized groups, and then kind of perform that that way. So it's going to give you a little bit more range there. WDS connector is kind of like a build on that. It gives you the capability to have everybody kind of proxy through the WDS connector. Um, usually whenever anybody's doing the on-site setup, this is the most common if the McAfee client proxy is not used. Uh, the reason why is because it maintains a solid and continuous connection with uh, our Active Directory server. Um, well, continuous is a strong word, but it checks it about four times a day to make sure that you're constantly up to date and that um, you're not you know, trying to filter people that aren't in existence with you more or are not with the company more or situations like that. So it's um, constantly updating, makes it a little bit easier on you as a whole um, to have that WDS connector in place. So definitely an option there. And then the McAfee client proxy. This is a newer release and um, is actually something that I was pretty excited about just because it has the capability to just you know, ex completely expand the possibility of the web protection product to really its true intended functionality, which is to work and protect people no matter where they are. So what this does is it actually puts an agent 
on the machines and it redirects them to us through your portal. So you can put these on every single individual's machine and no matter if they're on premise, uh, they're you know two miles down the road connected to Wi-Fi or they're at a Starbucks in China, they're still gonna be recurring and reporting their information through you. You're still gonna be scanning for malware, you're still gonna be protecting them and they're gonna like you're sitting right next to the individual. Another powerful thing here is that sometimes users like to do a hybrid solution where they have an on-premise technology and they have the McAfee client proxy. Um, if for any reason that this is a fit for you, which is rare, usually the McAfee client proxy uh, in comparison with the uh, SaaS product or in pairing with the SaaS product works very, very well and people don't need that. But if you do need a hybrid technology, the McAfee client proxy can sync up with our internal services as well and actually know whether it's at home or not. So it can say, you know what, uh, whatever I'm, on site on during this IP range authentication or at this IP range, I'm going to go ahead and turn off and I'm going to proxy through uh, the on-premise gateway. And then whenever I leave, I'm going to turn on the McAfee client proxy. That's for really, really specific environments. Uh, not a lot of people have to do that because 99% uh, of the functionality you're going to get right out of the McAfee client proxy. But if you do have really specific requirements that you have to adhere to on site, maybe it's a compliance guideline or something like that, this lets you do both. So keep that in mind, kind of put it in the back of your mind and just remember it. But other than that, um, this is how I recommend all of my people getting really set up is through the MCP because it's got a permanence to it. It works very well. And it them anywhere. Now, I've kind of gone through the web protection product. Um, you know, the only place that I really didn't talk about is forensics. Um, that's because, I mean, the forensic data that we have, we don't have a whole bunch of it in the side of this because it's a demo environment. Uh, but what you can see is you see all the information here that you can actually scan and search by. So if you need to pull someone's records or pull someone's information or pull a user's information, you can do any of that. You can download, export it, send it to HR if you're about to terminate an employee. Whatever the situation is, whatever you're trying to accomplish, you should should be able to portal a report based on all of these filters, um, have it uh, display here and then download it and send it to wherever you need to send it. So that forensic data is available to you. Uh, other than that, one last thing that I did want to make sure and do for you is the calculation of the return on investment. Uh, very, very important to be able to make sure that you can convey that because a lot of people um, don't actually have a web protection solution in their environment. But as I said previously, it's responsible for about 60% of infections on desktops. Um, so let's just say you take that number. Uh, you take 10 desktops get infected every single month. That means about six of them are most likely infected because of web protection to some extent. So, or, or from a lack of having web protection to some extent. Um, and if we remediate and we uh, determine that all those machines in order to fix each one of them costs about $150, which is fair. Um, it usually ranges between uh, $100 to $200 to uh, fix a machine that's been infected from operational expense, software, all that other good stuff that you have to reinstall and all that other good business. Um, $150 is about what it would take in order to get that back up and running and functional again. Um, that's about $900 a month. Well, if you take $900 a month and you put that for 12 months, that's about $10,800 you spend because of a lack of web protection or $10,800 every year you spend because you lack web protection of some sort in your environment. Um, that's a pretty big number because my thing here is is that with these web protection solutions, especially with a SaaS web protection solution like I just went through, uh, it's usually going to cost about a third of that, maybe half of that to a third of it, I guess you could say. So very, very minimal costs associated with a solution with this, with a true calculatable return on investment, which is what you ultimately want to be able to show whenever you're, uh, you know, proving the existence of a product. So. Um, Anyway, I mean, you know, I've kind of gone through a lot of stuff today. If anybody needs anything or has any questions, uh, please reach out to me. You can go to my website. It's uh, foxlogicsc.com. Once again, foxlogic and then sc.com. Um, there's going to be areas wherever you can request quotes, get information, um, leave comments, anything that you really want to do. Uh, just send that out over there. Also, I'm going to be monitoring the videos themselves. So if there's any comments or questions that you had for me uh, as a whole, you can just put them in the comment area and I will try and get back to them. I'm trying to check that once a day. Um, other than that, if you need something, get in contact with me, but I appreciate you taking the time to uh, go through this demonstration with me. If you need something, get in touch, but I'm logging off. Have a good day.